stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your Let's get going here, you guys. Let's get rock and rolling. Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to be. Mark chapter 9. i got a couple of announcements, and then uh, we're going to continue with our series on Gripped. Um, let, me tell you, let me tell you a couple of things. Um, this Sunday, um, I shared this if you watched it on Facebook Live so far, but uh, this Sunday, um, next time you see me, uh, Sunday I'll be 40. Um, yay! Hey! I didn't think I'd ever make it that far. I, I honestly, I I haven't made it that yet. True. Um, so that means one thing, which is my mother's real old. So, uh, yeah, she's been calling me all uh, every day this week, telling me about how old I am, and I'm like, yeah, well, you uh, you had me. So. I'm actually going to pause our series this Sunday, and I want to talk from a standpoint of um, what I'm looking forward to in the future from our church. And I want to talk to you about myself uh, as far as how I'm leading, not not me, we're talking about Jesus, but I'm talking about how I'm leading into my 40s. Because as I look back over my life, I've been, I've been doing ministry uh, at some capacity from working inside a church since I was 17 years old. I started out when I was 17 as an intern. Once I said I felt like God was calling me to ministry, the church kind of put me on staff. So I've been working in a church for the better part of 23 years, several different churches. Oh, thank you, thank you. Depend on which church you talk to. Um, so as I look back and look at um, you know, where we're headed and what we're doing, you know, you look back over your life, you, you, you ought to do it every now and then. I was talking to Jeff today. He turned 60. And I turned 40, and I said, Jeff, what's your goals in your 60s? He said, survive. And so, uh, um, and I'm struggling. Tyler, where my earpiece? So, um, it affects you. It affects you as we go into the future. I've made a life commitment to be here. It affects you how I'm going to lead this church, where we're headed. Uh, I've got more mistakes in my rearview mirror than I do successes, but I hope that in the future I've got more successes than mistakes. And so I think in order to know where you're going, you got to know where you've been. And so um, I just want to share uh, from Scripture uh, the understanding of faith. You spell faith, R-I-S-K, risk. And so we're going to be a church of risk, and we're going to take risk uh, for Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that. So I want to I talk about faith and, and taking risk this Sunday, okay? So if you've been enjoying this series, don't don't bail on me because you go, well, he's not talking about addiction. There's going to be some part of that that's going to apply to what you're doing because we're talking about faith and taking risk. And there's nothing more risky than dealing with folks that have addictions and issues. So um, this Sunday, be here. Um, I said on that Facebook Live, one of my favorite songs is A Pirate Looks at 40. So this Sunday is going to be A Pastor Looks at 40, all right? All right, a um, couple of other announcements that you need to know. Marriage retreat, all the spots have been filled. And by the way, i tell you that because um, we've got the, the marriage retreat booked out, planned. It's all in the box. It's ready to go on March the 1st. So if you're going on that very soon, you're going to be able to you know kind of get a schedule very soon um, so you'll know what times we're doing what. Uh, some of y'all asked when we start. In the past, um, we started at 7 o'clock. But here's what the Grove does. We go to marriage retreat, if you've been before, start at 7, we end up getting out after 9, and then everybody wants to go eat, and half the restaurants are closed down. So what we're doing this year is we're actually starting at 6.30, and I know some people say, well, I can't get there by 6.30. It's okay. We're going to do the introduction, introduction at 6.30. 
uh, and then we'll have a uh, time of giveaways and stuff after the first session, and then we'll do our second session on Friday night. We're going to break about 8.15 on Friday night this year to give everybody time to go eat and hang out. So if you're thinking I have to eat before I get there, if you're going, if you think I have to eat before I get there, it's not true. You're going to have time to eat afterwards, okay? So I know some of you aren't going and you could care less, but that's for my friends that are going. <laughs> And pass it along if somebody wants to talk about it or is asking about it. But that's March 1st and 2nd. Grove Life is February 24th um, at 4 o'clock. And so if you're interested in Grove Life, um, you can sign up at alumnigrove.com or call the church office. We'll get you signed up. Um, and then uh, after Grove Life, we have Grove Life Continue with my friends John and Kara Clayton, uh, who just slid in. And uh, they're going to help people that come to join the church or want to know more about the church get plugged into the church. And I heard that you guys had a fantastic party while I was gone that I was unable to be part of. Tyler was there. He bragged on it all week and reminded me that I wasn't there. And uh, so whatever. He said somebody was trying to give him a horse. And so... Uh, at the party. I don't know what that's about, but the last person that needs a horse is Tyler Brown. Anyways, whatever. Um, but it was great and so thankful for them. Also, uh, two more things, and then I want to get started, is uh, men, we're having a men's conference. You know, we just did Johnny Hunt's men's conference. It was fantastic. Johnny Hunt and his crew did a great job. But then we also do one on our own, and we partner with Neil Crass, uh, Willie Gallagher, and Big Emory uh, Church. And last year we had that here, had several hundred uh, uh, men that were here. This year we're actually going to uh, Pastor Neil Crass's church, Big Emory Baptist, um, and that's going to be on March 23rd, okay? So I'll be speaking, Neil Crass will be speaking, Willie Gallagher will be speaking. It's called Rise Up. Uh, if you know anybody in the Harriman area, Rockwood area, Oliver Springs, in the area, Kingston, wherever, invite them March 23rd. I think it's going to be, I think they're going to start eating at 5, and the, the conference starts at 6. It is a Saturday night. Um, but it'll it'll be fun. And then also, uh, we have a men's Bible study that's going on right now that Dave Harden is leading. That's at Our Town Cafe. Um, and uh, it starts at 6.30, I believe, on Tuesday. Is that right, Jason? 6.30, Paul, 6.30 on Tuesday nights. And I think it's 6.30, 7.30. I think they had about 21 guys there last night. Um, and I encourage you, you gentlemen to go be a part of that at Our Town. It's, it's great. Um I am, I'm, I'm not been there. It's harder for me to get there. Not that I'm avoiding it at all, but I do CRs on T or CR on Tuesday night. So, um, but I want to encourage everybody that can to go to that, to our town. Hey, here's a cool new thing. Um, on Sunday mornings now, starting this Sunday, you're supposed to know what I'm about to say. We wore the same shirt today. All right. So this Sunday, we're actually going to start serving our town cafe coffee, uh, coffee here at the Grove. So. That's kind of cool. So drink up. They uh, are thankful for that. But that starts this Sunday? Yeah. All right. Well, I want to talk about enabling tonight, talking about the mind of an addict. Uh, Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to be on that. Uh, anybody have any prayer requests tonight before we start? Any prayer requests? Judy, okay. Anybody else? Okay. We'll get, we'll, yeah. Go right here. Say that again. I had one talking right here. Go ahead. Bailey Sargent, sweet young lady. I just spent the weekend with her. Uh, she didn't pass out on us. Yeah, she, I think I scared her to death because she had that look. Somebody said, Bailey doesn't feel good. I said, get her down here. We're having breakfast. And I made her sit down across from me. And in her eyes, I could just tell she's 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 not feeling good. And I said, what do you need? What do we need to get? I was getting everything, and I was like, get her juice, get her, what is it? What, what can we do? I said, what do you do when you're not feeling good? She says, I normally just lay down. I was like, all right, we're gonna, what, don't be late, don't be passing out. So she did fantastic, but we do need to pray for her, because I know you guys are really trying to figure out what's going on with her and, and get that uh, settled and dealt with. Fantastic young lady. Love your daughter. Somebody else? Okay. Oh, did she? 
Okay. Awesome. Yeah. A couple of years ago. Hey, don't run off after church. Catch me up on that, please. Yeah. Yes. good all right well let's uh let's pray and then we're going to talk about the neighbor and god i love you i thank you so much for tonight i thank you for your love for us um what a wonderful day it's been just for the sunshine reminds us of spring new beginning and god i pray that you would just continue to work in this church continue to allow us to be um just the your word says that that we can be the aroma of Christ. I pray that we would be that aroma in our community, in a place where uh, we love and live. But it, uh, it's true, man. The, the principal tower of this area confuses, leads people astray. He stops. He blocks. He does whatever. And I pray that we would be a church that goes, that gives, meets needs wherever they might be. And God, we've heard many of those here tonight. Whether it be Stephanie or Bailey or uh, Judy um, or be the new births uh, that have happened in our church uh, or be the Crawfords or a cousin or whoever it might be. God, you've heard all of them by name. And I pray that you would minister to those families uh, comfort and peace. But then when it's appropriate, allow us to do that as well. God, we give you all the praise. I pray that you teach us great things tonight. Teach us how not to be enablers. To those that we love so much that they might see uh, see uh, just total uh, just freeness in their life. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. There's cake. There's yellow cake with chocolate icing. Go on, girl. Uh, so... I walked around Washington, D.C. I come back and I said, I got to eat better. And um, Monday they took me to Pizza Hut Buffet. No, it wasn't good. And then today I ate stuff that was grilled and fresh greens. And I was doing so good. And I am still hungry. And I was doing so good. But then a, a lady came out and she gave Jeff ice cream for his birthday. I gave in, dude, because I decided I don't mind having some little, you know, pudgy areas on my legs and hips. It's okay. More of me to love. All right. Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to look. Enabler. Let me ask a question. Are you an enabler? You know what I found? People that get told that they're an enabler get mad about it. They get mad when they get told that they're an enabler. In fact, sometimes people will ask, what can I do to help? What do you think I should do in my life? How can I help them? What do I need to do? And you say, well, first of all, you need to stop enabling. And they go, I'm not an enabler. How dare you? You don't know me. Enabling is a real touchy subject. But if we're going to talk about addiction, we have to talk about enabling. And we have to talk about enabling because it's such a huge uh, issue in most relationships. Two words that you need to write down, you need to hear, and you need to know is enabling and codependency. Enabling and codependency, all right? Now, enabling, just in case that you're wondering what enabling is, 
I'm going to give you a test in just a minute to see if you are an enabler. Because some of you are enablers and don't think you are. Where are you going? You going this way? Oh, you're enabling us. Get yourself out of here with that sin. Who wants some of this? I'm not. That's got coconut in it. TJ, what you want? Yellow with the chocolates. Right here. Little Bruce. Two. There you go. There it is. She's the only one's got an excuse. Oh man, give me here. In case y'all are wondering, the baby's name is Bruce. Bruce Naramore. That's awesome. This is not a sermon illustration, in case you're all wondering. This is real life. I was preaching at Water Angels one time outside, and they had me outside, and they said, we're going to eat after you get done. How long are you going to preach? I said, I'll probably preach 35 to 40 minutes. They said, that's fine. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs. About five minutes into me preaching, they fired that grill up and threw hot dogs on it, and my sermon was over. <laughs> Everybody got up from where I was and went over to stand around the grill. And I prayed just like that. What did you say? You can't? Did that just hit you? Oh, I didn't know if we were having a conversation. You just jumped back into it because that's like one of those things. It's cool. <laughs> you probably won't remember saying that later, so it's good. All right, let's talk about enabling. Two words you need to know, enabling and codependency. You need to know both of those words, okay? <clears throat> both of those words when we're dealing with addicts are huge, and both of those words are bad words to folks that are dealing with it but don't want to admit it, okay? Uh, but they're not bad words. It's real life, and that's the way that it is. Enabling is this, and I'm just going to give you a definition, and we're going to look at something. Enabling is a verb, obviously, you know that. <clears throat> but it means to make able, to give power, means, competence, or ability. It means to authorize. So when you enable something, you either make it able to happen, you give it power to happen, you give it the means to happen, the competence to happen, the ability to happen, or you authorize it happening. That's enabling, okay? So when we begin to say, well, I don't enable, do you give it power? No, I don't give it power. Then why won't it stop? Well, I'm not an enabler. Do you give it means? No, I don't give it means. Did you give them 20 bucks? Yep, you just gave them means. You just enabled. Uh, do you enable? No. Where do they live? My home. Do they do that in your house? I don't know. I don't ask. I don't want to know. You're authorizing the use in your home. You're enabling. I don't really authorize it. The very fact that you don't stop it and it's happening under your roof means you authorized it. Right? Um, and so you, you, you have to look at enabling. Come on in here. Come on. You're good. You're fine. I just started, actually. You want a piece of cake? <laughs> um. So you have to think about enabling in those terms. I'm going I'm to give you a little test here in just a minute to talk about whether uh, you are an enabler or not. The second word that we want to know is codependency. Anybody know what codependency is? Anybody heard the word codependency? Some of us have raised people to be independent, right? We know what independent is. I named one of my sons Maverick. Maverick means independent. I did not know that when I named him that. I've realized that in his life, he is independent. So independent is not anything that's frowned upon. Some people are independent. Uh, independent produces its own issues, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Codependency is exactly what you would think too. Co, two, all right? And in a, an addiction relationship, normally what you have in codependency is you have the addict and the enabler. They thrive together. One cannot live without the other. What you're going to hear, and if you've not heard me say this, you need to hear me say this right here. Normally when there's addiction and someone needs to seek help for addiction, there's an enabler that needs to seek help as well. 
Did you just hear that? Normally, in addiction, when there's an addict that needs to seek help, there's an enabler that needs to seek help as well. Okay? The enabler in a relationship will be just as sick as the addict. In fact, you want to shut that door? In fact, <coughs> sometimes before it's all said and done, minus the drug usage in the addict's life, the enabler will be more sick than the addict. Their whole life changes. Everything goes out the window. They begin to do things that they never thought that they would do. Right? And you begin to see this. Sometimes it's more than, um, <coughs> you know, just a, a, a one person. You'll have multiple people that become codependent upon one another, but they can't live without one another. I've, I've seen situations to where someone needs rehab. They won't go to rehab, not because they, they don't need it, but because their enabler won't allow them to go. I'm just scared. I'm just worried sick. I just don't know what's going to happen. Right? So this, this whole thing, this is huge when we start talking about this tonight. We talked about sickness in, in not being in your right mind last week. Hopefully you, you enjoyed that and we saw that and on slides and saw all that stuff. But this is just another form of that. So let's look at this together. I want to talk about enabling tonight. And it can be very confrontational in the sense that not that we're going to confront each other. I'm just going to lay it out there. And some of us may have to deal with the fact that you're an enabler, you know. And um, you can't expect your addict loved one to get better as long as you are a sick enabler right um it in once you realize what an enabler is and codependency is you see it you can see it i can see it on people a lot of times in order for me to get to an addict to help them i have to fight the enabler the enabler will make me the bad guy because i want to do stuff but we don't you're just too hard on them you know you're going to kill them right so let's talk about it. Y'all ready? Y'all good? All right. Mark chapter 9 tells a story. And I want to see this because when you look at Scripture, Scripture doesn't really talk, doesn't say enable, 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 enable. But the Bible kind of gives us this picture again. And I want to use another person that is battling um, demon possession to show you just kind of the scenario here. The Bible says in Mark 9 verse 14, I'm backing up quite a bit, but that's okay just to read it to you. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him um, mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast out cast it out, and they could not do it. Now remember, I shared this with you a few weeks ago. This is when we hit the, the faith the size of a mustard seed, and we've got it written on our walls and tattoos and everything else, which is fantastic, except for the fact that he's not just talking about financial mustard seeds and health. He's literally talking about someone that's sick here, demon possession, right? And this is where you get it. So he says this. Here's what Jesus says. Now, now get the picture. You got the picture. This kid has got a demon possession. He can't talk. It throws him on the ground. It, what it looks like is it looks like a seizure. Did you see that? That's what it looks like. Um, so whether it's a seizure or not, this is what is going on with this person. And he goes, I've brought my son to, to your disciples, and they can't do anything about it. And verse 19 says, and he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Sounds kind of harsh, Jesus. They brought the boy to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, which does exactly what we are talking about before. When you have someone who's battling something on the inside, the moment that they become aware of Jesus and he confronts them is when it acts up the most. You just need to know that. We're in a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle, okay? And so you start to see it. What happened when, when Jesus deals with the demon-possessed boy in the tombs, right? immediately he falls on his face and the demon speaks to Jesus and says stop terrorizing me or tormenting me when you get to this one the 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 man is forced in front of Jesus the boy is and the demon throws him down and he begins to act out this is falling to the ground he began rolling around foaming at the mouth and he asked the father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood it's often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on, him, on us and help us. Now look at what the father does. The father shows us the heart of addiction. 
You say, well, this kid's not a, an addict. I'm using it as a platform. I told you that. I'm talking about demon possession. But the father speaks for everyone in the situation, which is this. My son is the one on the ground rolling around having the fit, but it's all of us who are suffering. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Addiction does not, fa- d- does not just affect one person. It affects all of us. It affects all of us. Now, if it's in your home, it affects all of you. If it's a mom or a dad, it affects the mom and the dad, and it affects the kids. It affects all of us. Why is this important to bring up at the Grove? Phil, why would you spend six, seven weeks t- talking to us? Because this addiction problem is affecting all of us, right? These kids that are going through these school systems are our kids. They're going to be our children who are addicts. You say, well, that's not in my home. Folks, let me just tell you something. I, I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. I spend so much time with people who are addicts. I spend time with their parents. Their parents look just like you. They raised them right, took them to church. You know what's funny about Ted Bundy? That was a quick leap, wasn't it? <laughs> Subtle. Just work that right in there. When they start talking about Ted Bundy, Bundy, you remember he was one of the most notorious serial cl- killers. There's a there's a new Netflix documentary out on him uh, that that I'm watching through. Mandy hates me watching it. I turned it on the other night. She goes, "I'm gonna have nightmares all night." I was like, "Shut your eyes." Uh, I like to know how I'm into the way people think. You know what they said about Ted Bundy? He was in church every Sunday when he was young. I'm just telling you, if we're not careful, we will make this their problem. This is not their problem. It's all of us. And if you've got a friend who has an addict in their family, it's not just that addict who is the, it's all of them. And that's going to become your problem, Right? We begin to talk about enabling and begin to talk about doing all this. Guys, we've got to raise our eyes up. When people step up and there's things that we can do and we can stop it, and they begin to go, no, I'm not doing this, or our community doesn't need this. Our community needs it, right? There's, so, there's some people that's gotten so stinking smart in our community, their brains are falling out. And they're not going to wake up till it's on their living room carpet because this is our problem. It's us, Right? It ain't my problem. I guarantee you if you went through a drive through window today, there's a 99.9% chance that the person that made your hamburger is doing meth, heroin, or smoking weed. Am I telling the truth? Or all three. Thank you, Beth. In the parking lot between shifts or on smoke break. No, not mine. Maybe that's why your fried tastes funny. All I'm saying. I'm just telling you it's a problem. You said, Phil, don't talk about that. I'm just telling you the truth. Y'all need to know. He says, and Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. So he says to him, here's what, here's, what the, here's what the father says, if you can help him. And Jesus makes sure that we know in Mark chapter 9 that all things are possible to him who believes. Jesus wants you to know, first and foremost, you write down your friend's name or whatever. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. It is a fact with Jesus Christ they can be set free. Enabling is about the issue of trying to fix or save somebody that you can't fix or save. Listen to me. The only way we're ever effectively going to deal with enabling is when the enabler is willing to break ties and turn that person over to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can fix them. This father has been trying to fix his son. Do you see this? This father has his son joined at the hip. It's a picture of enabling if you really want to see it. He's been with his son. He's trying to help his son. He's taking his son around. What is he doing? He's giving him opportunity. He's taking him. He went to the church and he said, your disciples can't fix him. Well, it sounds like most, most relationships I've seen where somebody's trying to help somebody. And Jesus is there and he's almost lost faith that anything can be changed in his son. And he goes, if you can help us, help us. And Jesus says, if I can. He says, all things are possible, right? All things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, and here's, here it is, I do believe, help my unbelief. That is the verse of the enabler. I believe they can get better. I don't believe they can get better. I believe they can get better. I don't know if they'll get better. I believe they can get better. I'm about to give up. I do believe. Help my unbelief. 
And so what happens is in an enabling relationship, here's what happens. There's a moment when you believe fully, if you're a believer, you believe that Jesus Christ is going to, first of all, first of all, let's just back up. If addiction hits your family, the first thing that's going to happen is shock, awe, and denial. I don't care who you are. You're going to be shocked, especially if you don't come from that background. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be all of it. It's going to overwhelm your thinking. And then the second part of that is going to be denial. This isn't happening. Then something's going to happen to you, and you're going to think, well, I can just talk to them, and I'm going to tell them to straighten up. You weren't raised this way. You just weren't, you weren't raised this way. This is not how we act. And none of that's going to work. And then you're going to finally get to where you voice what's going on at home with someone that you trust, and you're going to get in a prayer group and support system and hit all these prayer you know, circuits, and they're going to remember your son or your daughter. It's a... It's an unspoken prayer request. It's all those things, and you're going to have all your faith in Jesus Christ, and you're going to fall down to the cross, and you're going to fall down at the altar, and you're going to weep, and you're going to cry, and you're going to write in your journal, and you're going to devotion, and you're going to be more spiritual than you've ever spirit, been spiritual in your life because you need Jesus Christ to show up in a big way and set your child or your husband or your mom or your dad free. You're going to hang in there, and you're going to beg, and you're going to plead, and you're going to make deals, and you're going to do everything because nothing is impossible without Jesus Christ. And then you're going to struggle, and they're going to do good, and 28 days is going to go by, and they're going to come home from Alabama, and you're going to put them in the car, and they're going to look good, and they're going to be a little bit fatter than they were, and healthier than they were, and talking a little bit better than they were, and you're going to believe it, man, and you're going to have the best worship service you've ever had on a Sunday, because Jesus Christ set your son or daughter free, or your husband or wife free, and two weeks later, they've relapsed. You're going to do that about four or five times, and you're going to realize that you're in a pit that is so dark that you're not even sure Jesus can get them out of it. Now, you're not going to say that, but that's what you're going to think. You say, well, I've never felt that way. Sure you have. Sure. And then we're going to begin to blame them. And we're going to begin to blame their friends. And ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to make excuses for what they're doing because we slowly give up. If I'm going to give up, I'm just going to make an excuse for what they are, and I'm going to become an enabler to make sure that they don't go dying on the street. I'd hate to think about them being homeless. I can't imagine how it must feel to be them. And you give up on the fact that Jesus Christ could set them free. But I want you to know something. Jesus Christ can set them free. And the hardest thing to do for a parent or for a husband or for a wife or a son or a daughter is to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to enable this behavior. I'm going to turn you over to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can do anything about it. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to like this, but this is true. Most everybody in this room does not have the guts to do what it takes to see your son or daughter set free. I'm just telling you. Some may, some may not. It's painful. And I don't say that like some big bad sheriff, like I've got all the answers. I certainly do not. But I'm telling you, when push comes to shove and you're pushed into a situation that you didn't ask for, and you're having to make a decision for somebody that you love that you don't want to make, Everything inside of you is going to say, I don't want to do this. I love them. I care for them. I don't want to mess up the relationship. I don't want to do all this stuff. And you know what the enemy's going to do? He's going to walk you right back into becoming the best enabler that person's ever had. Because you're going to be afraid that if you make this decision, it's going to hurt them or affect them or kill them. And you're not going to make it. You're going to call me. You're going to call friends. You're going to talk it up. You're going to be scared to death. You're going to ask what our opinions are. We're going to tell you what the opinions are. We're going to try to help you based on a professional understanding. And when push comes to shove, you're going to run under the table. Because, because you don't trust Jesus enough. Now, that's a hard statement, but it's true. And it's not very popular, right? That's not, now, everybody wants to kill Philip except for Hudson. Hudson wants to talk to me. That's okay. Babies don't bother me. I don't want another one, but they don't bother me. <laughs> I was sitting on that jury, and this old doctor that was on there, he says to me, I told him I had children. He said, he, he used to be a, a surgeon, a, 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 or a um, oral surgeon, he said, preacher, I mean preacher, everybody had a nickname, mine was preacher, well it was mouth, they called me mouth, 
Uh, imagine that. He said, I'm going to tell you. He said, you got 14-year-olds? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm going to save you a lot of heartache. I said, okay. He said, now you're about two years late. You're late. About a year late. But you need to listen to me. And I said, what's that? He said, when your children turn out to be teenagers, you just have to look at them and understand that on every level, they are lit- literally and clinically insane. <laughs> and if you know that they are, then you can deal with them. I said, how long does it last? He said, to about 35. I said, all right. <laughs> so I love babies, but I've got some lunatics at the house. Enabling is hard to deal with, you guys. And I don't say any of that stuff as a tough guy. I'm not a tough guy. I'm a pushover. I really am. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I only fight and stand my ground when I have to. I'll stand up and I'll speak out when I think something's wrong or needs to, you know, toe the line. Otherwise, I'm a pushover. My wife will tell you that. I talk a big game, but then I normally, I give in. My staff will tell you I've got the biggest heart on staff, and that's the reason that they have to watch me so much. Sometimes people get mad at PJ because she's a finance person. She has to tell people no, and they don't want to hear it. But I tell them all the time, she tells me no a lot more than she tells you no. And if I still like her, you better still like her. You understand what I'm talking about? It's my heart. You know, it's, it's just who I am. And so when I talk to you, I know there's some enablers in the room. I don't know who you are. So if you feel like I'm talking to you, I'm not. I don't know who you are. Um, but I'll just tell you, dealing with enabling is hard because of what is about to be expected. So let's talk about it real quick to see if you're an enabler. Help my unbelief. The question is, and you need to write this and ask this down, do I trust Jesus with my attic? Do I trust him? If the answer is yes, then you have to be willing to get out of the way. Okay. If you can't get out of the way, then you have to be willing to write down, no, I don't trust Jesus enough. If you trust Jesus enough, listen to me. He doesn't need you to fix him nor save him. He may have needed you for the birthing of him or the raising of him. Sometimes enablers deal with guilt. I'm willing to put up with stuff because I feel guilty that I allowed stuff. But you can't do that. I've seen people raise kids the exact right way, whatever that way is. And they still go a different direction than they should have been raised. I've seen people grow up without the right guidance and turn out fantastic. Folks, I'm just telling you, when you're raising your children, apart from Jesus Christ, it's a 50-50 shot. You may not want to hear that, but that's the truth. And so you have to be willing to understand that before those children or those the spouse, if you will, spouse, I'm just saying children, but let's say spouse, let's say mom and dad, before they were yours, they were God's. And you have to be willing to get out of the way and draw lines in the sand. So let's talk about it. Here, here's how do you know, how do you know um, if you're an enabler. Here's a couple of questions you need to, to ask or statements. I've just put these in my notes. Um, enablers, number one, don't want to hurt the alcoholic addict's feelings by saying no. Or I'm not comfortable with that. Or just not agreeing with their plan. So the first, the first thing an enabler is, uh, an enabler has a hard time saying no to their addict or alcoholic friend. Or I'm not comfortable, right? They have a hard time saying that. They just agree with the plan. Number two, two enablers are afraid of the anger or retaliation that might come from not granting their request. <coughs> so what happens in this particular case for enabler is. I just go along because if I don't go along, it's going to be worse. So I'd soon just do it and get it over with. Okay. <coughs> Who else does that sound like? Does that not sound like the parent of a one-and-a-half-year-old throwing a fit in a restaurant? When, when my wife says, he's not getting any of that candy. Ah! People start looking. Guess what he gets? Candy. That'll shut him up. So, so you start looking at this, and you start seeing some really kind of some characteristics, and you need to answer these for yourself. I, I can't answer these for you. You know that, but you're afraid of the anger or the retaliation if you just go along with it. Number three, afraid they might do something bad. They might act out. How do you know 
How do you know if you're an enabler and you're bowing down to this? They'll say something like this. I'll show you. You'll be sorry. So you, so you back up and you don't go through with what you're planning. I see this a lot with folks. They make a plan. They start to stick with it. And the person that they're trying to help or get help says something along the lines of, I'll show you or you'll be sorry, and they back up. Now, you have to fill in the blank what is after that. Sometimes it's you'll be sorry because you'll never see me again. You, I'll show you I'll kill myself. You'll be sorry I'll hurt you. Right? This is what addicts, alcoholics, abusers, whoever, this is what they say. So an enabler has heard this before. You've heard it, but you're still there. You're still putting up with it, and they use it more. Than, you've probably heard it more than once. If you if you folded to it once, you folded to that statement more than once, and it it becomes their go to. And then and then probably what's happening for the enabler is there was one time they said, "I'll show you," and you got enough courage. Finally, you were on your own, but you had enough courage to say, "I don't care what you have to show me. You won't." And you pushed back, and then they did something real stupid. They didn't do what they said they were going to do, but they tried, right? So they've been threatening to kill themselves. I'm not talking about suicide, but just they've been threatening to kill themselves, so you back off. The one time you stand up and you say, no, you're not, and I'm not going to be scared of you. They get the gun, get in the car, and drive off, and they're gone for three or four hours. See how that works? This is also known as, in case you don't know yet, manipulation. Well, what happens with the one time that they do it? You can't, you can't live your life that way. I'm just telling you. Okay? You say, are you saying that they won't do that? No, I'm not saying that they won't. There's a good chance that they will. There's a good chance that they won't. We don't know that. But here's what I do know. Is that person, that addict, is now in control of the relationship. Period. And they have you beat down and back down. You've lost the will to stand up to them. So you've become an enabler. Uh, number four. An enabler is afraid we will be perceived poorly or indifferent. Uh, what does that mean? It means that the addict or the alcoholic or whoever it is will turn the tables and they'll make it make you feel like you don't care about them. You're the bad person. Addicts are really good at this. I'm not. If you're an addict in here, I'm not picking on you. This is just true. Addicts work on an enablers emotion I, I i really feel like enablers are victims of emotional abuse if we really looked at it that's really what it is it's emotional abuse they work they work um the emotions of somebody so what happens is isn't this crazy the person whose body is full of toxic whatever it is or the person who is a physical abuser or the person who's drinking 30 beers at night and stumbling around the house, whatever, now, because the sober one or the calm one or the peaceful one in the house is not going to happen in here, the, the, the alcoholic, the addict, then makes it seem as if the sober, peaceful one is the mean one in the room. It happens all the time. You're not going to do this in my house. This is both our houses. Well, you're not going to do that in my house. You can get out. I'm, you, you can't kick me out. Just like you go down there to church and you read all that Jesus stuff and you're going to come home and you're mad and you got an attitude. I bet you got, I, let me see your phone. See how it goes? You got somebody else. <laughs> no, Jack, I ain't got nobody else. But I ain't going to be abused in my own home. You got somebody else. Hey, who's not? Wives don't treat people this way. You know, here we go. You know what happens to her? She ends up at church, sitting, crying, emotionally distraught, feeling like a heel because someone who is not in their right mind has convinced them that they're out of their mind. Right? I tell, I, I tell folks that I'm helping sometimes, I'll say, I'm not asking your opinion, I'm giving it to you. And you're going to say I'm this or that. And Beth will tell you this, I heard her, somebody tell me she said this today. If he takes his glasses off and points them at him when he's talking to you, he means exactly what he says. <laughs> Does that thing? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I did that. <laughs> so, so you got you to know that, right? Number five, enablers, um, um, they fall for this. Um, they always seem to fall for the one more time, one more chance. 
right? Now, if you're not an enabler, you don't live in this home, you need to know this is what will happen. But the addict, the alcoholic, the abuser, whatever person might be, once they're caught on the carpet, one of their manipulation tactics is, is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just give me one more chance, one more chance, one more chance. Everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a chance. One more time, I'll do it this time, I'll do it this time. And then here's, here's how you know, here's how you know, because you'll say this right here. Here's what an enabler will say. I believe them this time. This time is the key, though. All right. How many this times has there been before this time? Several. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this time. When you say, I believe them this time, you need to just go ahead and back up. I'm not saying that they can't do it this time, but you just need to go ahead and own it. You're an enabler. It should have never got to this time. Say, Philip, where are you driving? I'm about to tell you we're going to put some boundaries up if you're an enabler. Okay, you just need to know that. I'm going to steal my own thunder. Uh, number six, maybe this time will be different. It's sort of like number five, but we want to believe that this time it will be different. Uh, if, if you're thinking this time will be different without major changes in that person's life, whether that's rehab, whether that's moving out, whether that's boundaries, listen to me. It will never be different. I had a conversation with someone this week that I was counseling with that um, is – when I saw this person, they were struggling with some things, and they came to me because they said, I just I don't feel like myself. I'm struggling with some stuff, and I'm dealing with some stuff, and I'm kind of depressed, and blah, 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 whatever. They came back, and it was almost a month later. I said, you look better. I said, yeah, and they said, I'm better. I said, well, what changed? They said, nothing. I said, you're not better. Well, yeah, I am. I feel better. I said, you're not better. Well, I don't I look better? I was like, yeah, you look better. But what changed? Nothing. Well, then when did you start doing this? I just got up one day and just said, I'm better. And they said, you don't think I'm better? I said, I think you are right now. Well, what does that mean? Whatever you didn't deal with before is going to come back to get you later. It's different this time. No, it ain't. Not unless something's changed. Everybody can change. Listen to me if you're an enabler. You can write this down. There's nothing wrong with expecting to see change. Before you feed that in, that uh, addict with whatever else it is, there's nothing wrong with demanding to see change. Here's what I found: people that are going to change, that want to change, don't have a problem with that stipulation. People that do have a problem with changing and don't plan on changing will fight you tooth and nail. Number seven: you want to be liked. Enablers want to be liked. This happens to parents a lot. They're so afraid that the person that they're dealing with won't like them. You see this happen without an addict or an abuser or alcoholic. You see this happen with some parents with teenagers, right? Um, uh, if you're raising teenagers, this is a real thing. My kids, I walked out of the hotel at Washington, D.C. on Sunday. We're headed to church. I had a new pair of pants on. And I walked over to the van, and I'm trying to hurry to get everybody together. And one of my children, fruit of my loins, standing there looking at me and says, what do you got on? And I thought, I will knock you out. <laughs> and then immediately I walked away and thought, what do I have on? What is wrong with me, right? And I had to remind myself, my friends are not 14. My friends are 40. This is what we wear. <laughs> Hush puppies. Those real long, tall socks are next for me. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyways, whatever. I have to remind my boys I'm not interested in being your friend right now. I mean, I will be, but I'm not interested. We'll be friends later. Number eight, too lazy to change. We're too lazy to change. Some of us just don't have it in us to change so we just allow it to happen listen to me if, if you have something in your home like this or somebody that you're dealing with you're going to have to fight to i mean it's a, it's a battle it's just a battle normally i find this to be true uh most addicts abusers or whatever they wear down the enabler they're wore out you ever seen somebody that's been dealing with it for a long time somebody that they love their body looks like it you look tired well you're not sleeping well yeah sort of you know what's wore them down the relationship. They're up all night worrying about somebody that didn't even worry about themselves. 
right? So if you're going to change this relationship, it's going to take work. The easiest thing you can do is just go along with it. The easiest thing is, it, listen, if you're a lady and you have a husband that's not treating you right, and he's talking to you and he's abusing you, the easiest thing you can do is go along with it. You know why? Because if you go along with it, he'll stop. He'll just be easy. But you know that, that animal's still in there. The hardest thing to do is face it and demand that it change because you've got to work it every day. Right? If you have an addict, the easiest thing to do is just go, I mean, you know, I mean, after all, they're going to do it somewhere. Maybe not. But you gotta, you got to be aggressive with it. Uh, number nine, afraid. Just afraid. If you actually do what you've been advised as an enabler, you're afraid of what's going to happen. I say this in preaching. This is beyond addicts and anybody else. This is just true for life. Most people find more comfort in the chaos that they do know than the uncertainty that they don't. It's true. So some of us in here, you will just take it and take it and take it because at least you know what that looks like. This, which goes to number 10. This thing you've been doing, you've been doing it so long so you know it, so you're not even, you just let it go on. But what if I told you if you make a couple of changes and you're going to have to fight and not be lazy, it's going to take a little bit that you can actually see the results that you want. But what if, but what if, but what if, but what if, what if, right? What if? So let's, let's look at a couple things. So that's what enabling. Here's, here's some signs of enabling. So that's, that's some things. Here's some more signs. Ignoring the addict's negative or potentially dangerous behavior. Uh, enablers ignore the addict's negative or potentially da- dangerous behavior. They just ignore it. They act like it's not happening. Um, a lot of times enablers have a hard time how to express their feelings, especially if there are negative repercussions for doing so. So they have a hard time kind of saying what's going on on the inside. Enablers sometimes do. Uh, prioritizing the addict's needs before their own. Enablers do this. They prioritize the addict's needs before their own. It's crazy to me. Enablers will take, they'll use their vacation time. I mean, you work 15, 20 years somewhere, and next thing you know, you've used all your vacation time for this person. You're having to leave work to go to court. You're having to leave work to go to the hospital. You're having to leave work to do all this stuff. This person is not only running and running their life, they're doing it to you, and you've made it a priority. This is, this is why in marriages, when someone is dealing with an addict in a marriage, like a son or a daughter, the husband and wife will struggle to stay married because there will be one that will become codependent to make sure that they're okay, and they will prioritize the life of this person that's sick, and there will be another one that wants to put boundaries in place, and it's not long before the enabler and the boundary person butt heads because they don't like the way they're treating the person. You understand what I'm saying? And then the addict ends up winning all of it. And so, you know, enablers, they prioritize the addict or abuser. It's funny. You, you see this. It's not funny, but, but you see this a lot. You take a woman that's being abused. Oftentimes, she will bend over backwards to make sure that the abuser's needs are met above her own, even while being abused and then when you try to talk to her about what you see she thinks there's something wrong with you <coughs> um, enablers act out in fear um, they will do anything they can to to make sure nothing bad happens they, they react in fear um, they lie to people, honestly. You don't want to hear this, but enablers will lie. They will lie to cover the behavior of the addict. They will lie to cover the behavior of the abuser. They will lie to cover. So after it's over, you say, why did you lie to me? I was trying to, and they don't mean anything by it. They're just trying to cover it up. You don't want people to know what's going on, so you lie. Um, Here's a big one. Enablers blame people or situations other than the addict. Did y'all get that? The addict, and I'm not being negative when I say addict, the addict has always got an excuse. Always. But then the enabler comes along and makes an excuse for the excuse. 
You know they had a rough time growing up. You know that they were went through this. You know this is what happened. You know that guy just got them off on the wrong course. You know they met that person. They didn't used to be like this, but they met that person. He got an excuse. Okay. You got to be real careful. You, you need to look in the mirror and say, am I making excuses? If I'm making excuses, then I'm probably in, in enabling. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Forget addict, abuser, or alcoholic. Some of us do that for just people that we love. If you got a real hateful friend, you could become an enabler. Right? They bark and you go, oh, she just been, she's just having a bad day. No, she's been having 40 years of bad days. <laughs> That's who she is. She's hateful. Just call it like it is, man. Here's what. They're not trying to complain. They've just noticed some concern. No, they're a complainer. They start trouble. Are y'all with me? So, so don't don't think that this is way out there. Like, oh no, we all do it. Uh, an enabler resents the addict. This is an interesting thing. An enabler will prioritize life for, cover for, act out in fear for the one person they resent the most. They resent them. This is where this is where the relationship kind of really kind of gets weird is because the one that's providing all the resources to help them is the one that struggles with liking them the most. Okay. All right, so let's ask ourselves some questions. Number one, do you ignore or minimize dangerous behaviors from somebody that you love? Do you put the addict's person, the addict, uh, the addicted person's need before your own? Yes or no? These are yes or no questions. Do you have a hard time saying no? Do you frequently make excuses for the addicted person's behavior? Are you blaming yourself for their actions? Remember what I told you beginning? A lot of time enablers live here. You're blaming yourself for their behavior. Do you financially support your friend or family member who is addicted to whatever? No? You just let them live there. You're financially supporting them. No, I just let them use a car. You're financially supporting them. Well, how do you figure? Because it takes money to buy a car. It takes money to afford rent. And if you're taking both those off the table, you've just handed no money. You all with me? All right. Y'all mad yet? Number seven, do you lie or cover up their behavior? Do you continue, number eight, do you continue to endure the behavior even though it's running your life and theirs? Oh, define endure. You putting up with it? Well, this time it's going to be different. Okay, go back to point A. You're an enabler. I'm not being ugly to you. If you are, you are. But we got to figure it out. Um, and we got to figure out what we're going to do because there's two people losing their life. All right, so how do we break the cycle? Here we go. You ready? I'm going to give you, oh, man, we're going to make it on the home stretch. i got 11 more points. All right, here we go. I do. And I'm going to get all of them. So how do you break the cycle of enabling? If you're an enabler, if you've said yes, or if you know somebody. See, here's the thing about enablers. Um, enablers are kind of, I mean, enablers become oblivious to their enabling. Enab enablers fall right into the same category as an addict. Because you know what an addict will do? An addict will tell you how everybody's mean to them. Nobody likes me. I ain't going to that church. They're all going to look at me. I ain't got no friend. I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you what I hear, right? And you hear it too. They're hypocrites. They judge us. And the neighbor will feel the same way over time. They feel isolated. The enabler knows all the secrets. They cover for the secrets. And they assume everyone else knows the secrets. So they deal with guilt. They deal with struggling. They deal with all this. And then, then, then they feel like they caused most of it. Now an enabler normally will have a problem with another person. The enabler is the one that gives, right, the ability, the means, or the authorization for the addict to continue the behavior. If you take you away from the scenario, the behavior may continue, but they're going to have to work harder to continue the behavior because you're not there to make sure they continue their behavior. Okay? What do you mean? Well, 
We don't do anything for them. Okay, what about this? Do you provide them a place to live? Yes. Okay, so what we're going to do is you're going to stop being an enabler. They're gonna, they've got 10 days to get out of your place. I don't know if I can do that to them. Do you want it to stop or not? Yeah. Well, you give them money. You do whatever. So, so you are giving them the ability to continue that behavior. You're the one that is saying it's okay. You're the one that's saying this time it's going to be different. You're the one that keeps it going second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth, fifteenth time this has happened, but it's going to be different. You're allowing this behavior to continue. Now, here's what's going to happen. This person that's the enabler, if you've got more, let's say it's a child, if you have more than one child, the other children are going to begin to see that and they're going to resent you because of the excuses you make for this one. The enablers then going to look at the other child and say, you're too hard on your brother. You're just too hard on your brother. And the brother's going to say, no I'm not. We don't raise that way. I mean, I, I didn't get an A on my paper and you busted my tail. They were strung out in the living room the other day, and you put them to bed. So now what's going to happen is, is the, the addict has blown the family apart already because everybody's still in denial and trying to deal with what they don't know what to do with them, and they're trying to help them, and they're worried sick, help my unbelief, so they've tried to turn it over to Jesus, and nothing's changed. Then the enabler sucks up beside them because Jesus doesn't seem to be setting them free, so we've got to maintain their, we've got to make sure that we're there so that when they finally land, instead of catching them on the bounce, we're going to catch them when they land. When I got to get here, so what I'm going to do, the enabler ends up cutting out anybody else that sees the weakness in the, the relationship. Anybody that the enabler talks to that says, I'm, not, I'm just going to tell you, I love you enough to tell you, you're going to need to do this, and you can't keep doing that, you're, I'm done. You don't understand. It'd be different if you were having to deal with it. Because the enabler thinks that they're the only ones dealing with this. It's the only one. Even though there's multiple scenarios of this, mine's different and unique, and you just don't get it. An enabler can have a problem with a husband or a wife. The husband really wants to hold the line. But the mama says, that's my daughter, or that's my son, or that's my children, or whatever. And now all of a sudden, it's these two. And it goes on and on and on. You get mad at the, the, the bosses that had to fire them. You get mad at the rehab that let them go. I mean, good night. Every time we turn around, the police are pulling them over. They're targeting them. No, they've got heroin in their pockets, and that's illegal in every state. Are you with me? But these are the kind of conversations that get that happen, right? So they're just being mean to them. They, you know, they're marked in this town. They're not marked. People know, but they're not marked. You've become a, such an enabler that you now are a victim. Now there's two victims, or three, or whatever. So how do we break that cycle? Here's some real practical stuff. Uh, normally, if you deal with an alcoholic or an addict or even someone that loses their temper, they make a mess. And, and what I mean by that is, is they do stuff and don't remember it. Um, if you got an alcoholic, sometimes they'll get drunk and they'll knock stuff over and break stuff and not remember it or whatever it might be. You got an addict, they'll leave stuff out and do stuff or whatever. Most enablers come through on the back end of that and clean it up. So you got this person that's having these episodes, and they'll, they'll wake up or they'll come to, and everything's like it was before, and they don't even realize they miss the whole thing. The broken glass is picked up. The pipe is put up. The whatever is put up. The vomit is cleaned up. You want to break the cycle? Leave a mess out. Let that person wake up in that world that they created. Let them see it. And then let them clean it up. Right? Let them clean it up. If you tell your son or daughter to go to their bedroom and clean their room up, and they go in there and they clean the covers everywhere and throw their Legos across the room and they take their crayons out and walk, walk on the wall or mark on the wall, and you send them off to school, and all day all you do is pick up Legos and fold the clothes and fix the bed and wipe the wall down so that little Johnny, when he gets off the bus, comes back in and he sees his room put all back together together guess what you've just done you have created an environment to where this little boy or this little girl can do anything that they want all the time and they always know there's somebody there to clean up their mess are you with me you say well i have to live here i don't want that out in my living room i don't want that in my that's silly you do it one time 
Let them see it. There is no second chance. Everybody mess up. I don't want you to think that I'm not a merciful guy. I am. Y'all heard me on the front end? I am. One time turns into two times, turns into 15, turns into 25. I guarantee you, anybody's seen a scenario that I just explained has seen it more than once. How do you stop it? Leave it. Let them clean it up. You ain't got to be hateful about it. They might say something like this. You didn't clean that up? How long has that been laying there? Since last Tuesday? Why didn't you clean it up? It's your mess. Well, how long is it going to lay there? Till you clean it up. Well, I'll just leave then. Then I'll clean it up, but you ain't coming back. You see you see how your tone's got to change. Number two, uh, if you want to break the cycle as an enabler, I highly encourage you to do this, and I'm more than welcome to do this with you if you ever need help. Weigh your options. Options. Short-term pain versus long-term pain. Will helping the addict one more time help or hurt in the long run? Now listen to me. Here's what's going to happen. The enemy is going to tell you that if you make the hard call to do what's going to happen, that something bad's going to happen to them. You can't do that. Something bad's going to happen to them. Can I, can I listen to what I'm about to tell you? Nobody knows the future of someone who's an addict or an abuser or an alcoholic. Nobody. They can die in your house, in their bed, as soon as they die out on the street. They can die on the street as soon as they die in your house. Nobody knows. But one thing's for certain. If you don't weigh your options out, you're going to end up making decisions for them that's not going to pay off in the long run. You're going to fill in some gaps right here that if you just stop. I heard Mark Batterson say this on Friday, or on Sunday. Random, Friday, Sunday. He said on Sunday... He said, who have you been talking about that you need to talk to? Huh. And then he said these words, and what could you tell them that they'll thank you for in five years? My point is, is when you're, when you're weighing your options, what decision can you make right now that they'll thank you for in five years? That's the way you need to think. Don't think about today, okay? Listen to me. You make a hard call, listen to me. You're going to have hell to pay. I'm not saying that vulgar. I'm saying literal hell. It's going to unleash its demons of every sort. You're going to stay up all night crying. You're going to worry yourself sick. It's the first time you shut the door and said, don't come in. It's the first time you sent them walking. It's the first time you had to go to bed wondering if your son or daughter had a place to go to sleep. What if they can't? What if there's nowhere to go to sleep? They'll find a place to sleep. They don't have a problem finding a place to sleep when they run off for three or four days, do they? On their own. Okay. Hey, number three, refuse to let an addict put you or someone else in danger. You just refuse that. That should be a no-brainer, but it's not. Uh, here's number four. Keep going. Don't change your schedule or your plans just because they don't go or won't show up. How many times you had to not do something because you had plans with somebody and then they canceled at the last minute so everybody, keep going. Don't change your plans. You keep going. Well, I was just going to have dinner with them. Have dinner alone. Then when they ask you where you went, tell them you went on. Greatest thing can happen for an addict sometimes is let them see that life goes on. So many times they want to hold time right here. See, they've stopped. So they want you to stop. Um, get support for yourself. If you're an enabler or dealing with an addict, an abuser, or an alcoholic, or any of the other, listen to my words. Greatest thing I'll tell you all night, get support for, your he for yourself. You need it. I don't need it. You need it. I don't need it. You need it. I don't need it. You just proved you need it. You need it. What do I need it? Ain't nobody can talk to you. <laughs> all right. Number six, consider an intervention. Don't do that on your own. Number seven, make the commitment to stop helping financially. You have to do it. You st cut them off, dude. Well, I don't know where they're going to get money. They're going to start robbing places. Is that really what they're telling you? I'll just, I'll just start robbing. Okay, well, you'll go to jail. You can't tell them that. They'll do it. Tell them that. If my son ever tells me, Dad, if you don't give me 20 bucks, I'm going to go to school and beat a kid up and take his money, you know what I'm going to say? No, you ain't. <laughs> Number eight. I'm done. I'm out of time. 
Write this in big letters. I've got three more. Stop allowing abusive behavior. That's for the enabler. Stop it. You can't expect your addict friend, son, or daughter to stop if you won't stop. You are a mirror image of them. What you allow, you condone. What you allow, you encourage. So stop it. All right? Well, I'm done. I'm out. I gotta, I'm going to pray. Get you out of here. Go pick your kids up. I'm way over. God, I love you. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for knowledge and grace. It's one thing to talk about all this stuff. It's another thing to live it out. I pray that we would support one another, that we love one another. It is so hard to turn people over to you that we love. And just like the daddy of the boy that was demon-possessed, we say to you, I do believe, but help my unbelief. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Get out of here, y'all.